So who could have predicted this? It's Easter and nobody's showing up at church. Like even, even when you find yourself in a season of life that rarely or occasionally describes your church attendance, like this is the time you show up. Or even when you're in a place in life where coming to church is a weekly event for you, on Easter, you're a little early, you're a little focused, maybe a little bit dressed up, because this is Easter. Like this is when we celebrate that Jesus is alive but not today do we get to do that together. Today during a global pandemic, we, we can't safely be together. Now, I know that some of you are already thinking, hey, Michael, I've, I've decided that this is about the right distance between me and you. But all joking aside, COVID-19 is an opportunity for us it's an opportunity for some of us to realize just how important it is to be with other believers. And we can't wait to get back. For others of us, it's just enough different this year that we realize, you know what, I would have been at church, but I would have been going through the motions. God loves you. And he has something special to say to you today. I'm glad you're listening. And then maybe for you, you would say, I would not have been there in a building, but I'm checking this thing out online. God has my attention or I'm willing to consider. We're glad you're here. God loves you and you just might be surprised what he reveals to you today. It's an honor to be together with you, even though we can't be together today. Easter is a big deal for Christians. Actually, the entirety of Christianity rises or falls with the resurrection of Jesus. You see, Jesus, like many spiritual leaders, teachers, made some pretty dramatic claims. One of those was that he would rise from the dead on Sunday. So as he went into Jerusalem, he said, I will be arrested, uh, I will be crucified, and on the third day, I will rise from the dead. You see, here's the deal. Jesus was dead just like everyone else until he rose like no one else. Easter is everything to us who believe in Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. And so what we're going to do today is take a look at a resurrection account. And as we take a look at it, we, we discover a dramatic miracle that the eyewitnesses of the resurrected Jesus became so convinced that he was alive that they gave their lives to tell that story. So let's look at it. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, go ahead and turn with me to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. And if you remember about Luke's gospel, Luke said very clearly, I am working hard to put together an accurate representation of the life of Jesus. I have sought firsthand eyewitnesses, just like we decide court cases, firsthand eyewitnesses, and then we make a decision. The gospels provide for you the evidence you need to make a decision about Jesus. As we come to chapter 24, we have three eyewitness accounts of the resurrected Jesus. Account number one is that some of the ladies went to the tomb, assuming Jesus was still dead, to take care of his body that they didn't have time to do on Friday. As they came to the tomb, it was empty, and angels said to them, He is not here, he is risen. The second resurrection of account in Luke chapter 24 are two guys walking down the road toward Emmaus. And as they were walking and talking about all the chaos, everything that was going on, Jesus came up alongside them and began to have a conversation with them. And as they came into Emmaus, he revealed himself to them. And the moment they saw him for who he was, he disappeared. And so as we enter our text, we start in verse 36. In verse 36, it says, as they were talking about these things. So they're having a conversation about the ladies coming back, the tomb being empty, it's confirmed empty. And now these other two guys say that they saw Jesus and he revealed himself to them. So that's the conversation that's going on in verse 36. 
Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. So they're having a conversation. There's Jesus. And he says to them, shalom. Standard greeting, which meant peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. Jesus quickly calls them out on their disbelief. And he said to the disciples, guys, I told you this is what was going to happen. Why are you confused? Why are you frightened? Why do you think I'm a ghost? I told you I would. Now let's pause just for a second. Some of you have had the question, can I trust the Bible? Can I trust the Bible? And you've heard things like, oh, the Bible was written by normal people. Uh, it's filled with errors. It's been copied so many times. You know, there's been mistakes as it's been copied again and again and again over the millennia. And well, probably the people who wrote it had ulterior motives. Probably they had something to gain by. And then, you know, it's all open to interpretation. I think it says this, you think it says that. Now, can you trust the Bible is a much bigger discussion than what we can have here today. But let me give you two reasons, just two, that you can trust the Bible. Number one, the original first-hand eyewitnesses who became the leaders of this movement we now call Christianity became so convinced in less than two months that they gave their lives to tell the story of a resurrected Jesus. They gave their lives to tell a story they knew to be true. Number two, those original leaders, same people, are not portrayed as heroes in the story. Like they made mistakes, like right here. They are frightened, they think Jesus is a ghost, and they're they're just like startled and scared. One of the things I love about the Bible is that it is honest about us. Even the original followers of Jesus were not the heroes. And as they preached and declared and shared and pointed people to Scripture, they were pointing people to a story that really clearly made them out to be filled with doubts and fears, making mistakes. And yet they continued to point people to this story. Have you ever scared somebody? Like you got them good. And you scared them and you laughed. And then you told some of their friends about how well you scared them. But when you told their friends and their friends started to laugh at them, they started saying things like, well, I I really wasn't scared. I, 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 I knew you were there. I was just playing all along. And you're like, no, you were really scared. The Bible is clear. They were They were really scared. They they messed up. Like Peter, the point leader, portrayed in Scripture as a guy who missed it and then really missed it. He denied even knowing Jesus while Jesus was on trial. Three times. And he swore God, swear to God, I don't even know that guy. The Bible is honest about those original leaders. They didn't have ulterior motives. They gave their lives to tell what they knew to be true. So Jesus calls them out on their lack of faith. And and he says, look, look at my hands. Look at my hands. The last time they saw these hands, they were nailed to the cross. He said, look at my feet. The last time they saw those holes, there were spikes driven through his feet. And then Jesus says, touch me touch me. I'm not a ghost. Ghosts don't have flesh and blood. They don't have bones. Touch me. And then he says to them, hey, anybody have something to eat? I'll have a meal with you. You... Doubting Thomas gets some bad press when he needed to see touch. But it's clear that all of the disciples needed some help. Which is a Beautiful, beautiful portrayal of how Jesus helped them believe. Look in verse 41. 
they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling. Do you blame them? (laughs) Do you blame them? Do you blame them for marveling, for being amazed, for having like mind blown? Do you blame them? This wasn't a once in a lifetime. This is once in history event. Like they're having a hard time getting their minds wrapped around it. And yet there is Jesus, just like he did with Martha. Martha, Martha. He walked with them. He patiently guided them. They marveled. But also, we discover that they still disbelieved for joy. They were choosing not to believe, even though believing would bring them great joy. So like they're clinging to disbelief, even though believing would cause them celebration and joy. It's like they refuse to get their hopes up. They reacted like a people who had been burnt. They're like, yeah, I don't, I don't, don't, no, no, I, I can't go there. And actually, we can't blame them for feeling like they'd gotten burnt because Jesus disappointed them. Like, they were actually beginning to believe he was the Messiah. But their hope was that Jesus would be a Messiah for their nation specifically. That Jesus would specifically get rid of the Romans and this oppression that they lived under and they would again be a people with a nation by God's blessing. And instead of overcoming the Romans, it was those Roman soldiers who killed him. They'd gotten burnt and they found themselves in a place of like, oh man, I'd love to, but just no way can I go there refusing to get their hopes up. Some of you are there, aren't you? All all this time, you've thought religion or faith is for the weak. You've said, I don't don't need that. I'm a strong person. You want to believe, but but to believe, you got to drop that wall. Some of you have been hurt by a Christian Like a Christian violated you, hurt you, betrayed you in such a way that you'd like to believe in Jesus. But to believe in Jesus would require something else to happen. And some of you are mad at God. You prayed, but she died. You ask God to bring victory and deliverance, help, and it sure did not seem to come. You'd love to believe, but no way, no way can you get your hopes up. But Jesus was walking with them just like Martha and just like he wants to walk with you today. So he said to his disciples, guys, I've I've been telling you this all along. I've been revealing to you that this is God's plan all along. In verse 46 and 47, he explains it in detail. Like he describes it to them and, and gives us four really important pieces. He says, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer And on the third day, rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed. Four really important pieces. All four of these show up in the three resurrection accounts in Luke 24. First, as it is written, Jesus reveals to them that there is one narrative, one story, one plan of God being fulfilled. It is God's plan to bring salvation to his people. It is the story of history. Secondly, that the Christ should suffer. Like some of us have been in a place of thinking, you know, I'd like to believe in God, but how can a good God allow something like this to happen? 
in my life, global pandemic. How, how can God be good? And yet here, as Jesus takes them on this journey, he says, I told you that Christ would suffer. God's plan to save us included him entering into our suffering. How's that for a beautiful plan of God? How's that for how much he loves you? He comes into our mess. Number three, third day. That on the third day, Jesus would be raised from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus is him declaring victory over our sin and death. At first he was just dead, like everyone else. Until he rose like no one else. Third day. Repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed. When we turn from our way of like, hey, I'm good. I'm a pretty good person. I'm going to try harder. I I think I'll make it. And instead, discover faith in Jesus. Repent of our self-righteousness, self-justifying, and place our faith in the finished work of Jesus we experience the forgiveness of sins. And we have a story to tell. Jesus says to them, one story, God entering our suffering. The resurrection is God declaring victory over your sin and death. And number four, inviting you to turn to me. And then the miracle happened. Look in verse 45. Then he opened their minds. He opened their minds. It doesn't say he gave them a secret code. It doesn't say he gave them a secret handshake. Or he claimed to have some little message that was only for them. No, he he helped them connect the dots. What had been previously hidden was now clear to them. I remember when he opened my mind to understand You see, I was raised in church. I heard about Jesus all my life. God sent his son to save the world. But I remember when he opened my mind and I heard God sent Jesus to save me. All my life I heard people make bad choices. The Bible calls it sin and because of our sin, we fall short. And I remember the day I remember that season in my life when I realized, oh, I have sinned and I do not deserve to go to heaven. I remember hearing all of my life, if you will repent and place your faith in me, you will be saved for everybody else. But I remember the time it became very personal when God said to me, come. You see, God is inviting you just like he invited me. He's not asking you to have blind faith. There's actually great evidence in the historical Jesus of Nazareth. There's actually great evidence that his closest friends became so convinced that he was resurrected like no one else that they gave their lives to telling that story. You don't have to have blind faith but God is inviting you to have faith. God is inviting you to repent, which means to give up. To give up saying that you're better than most. To give up trying again. To give up saying, I'm a pretty good person. And instead to say, God, I need help. And you can say that to him today. You can pray with me right now. God, I need your help. I believe you sent Jesus for me. That he lived perfectly, died sacrificially, and rose victoriously. Today, I ask you to forgive me of my sins and accept me as your own. 
Thank you, God, for saving me. And the Bible says really clearly, if you believe that in your heart and you confess that with your mouth, you will be saved. And there might be part of you who thinks, man, that's too good to be true. Can I really get my hope up in that? You can. Because it's repentance. It's a turning from where you used to be going to where you are now going. Who you used to be trusting, that was you, to who you are now trusting. His name is Jesus. And he accomplished salvation for you. Accept the gift of life through Jesus and you will be saved. Repentance brings forgiveness. And so in verse 47, it's a story to tell. Repentance and the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed to all nations. Beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. So to these first disciples, the guys who had not yet put all the pieces together, but over the next 50 days, less than two months, they would become absolutely convinced and bold about their faith in Jesus that he is like no one else. In less than two months, they were so convinced they would give their lives to tell this story. A story to be proclaimed to all nations for all times. We have a story to tell. We have a story to tell from scripture of what Christ has done. We have a story to tell from our own lives of when Christ opened our minds and we made the connections that before we had missed. And then we have a story to continue to tell as he continues to transform our lives as we follow him. Repentance, a turning from, brings forgiveness. The forgiveness of sins that is to be proclaimed. And Jesus says, you are my witnesses. And that's exactly what they did. They gave their lives to tell the story. And you and I have an opportunity to tell the story of what Christ has done and is doing in our lives. Here's the beautiful Easter message. Jesus was dead like everyone else until he rose like no one else. That is our hope. That is the gospel. Jesus is our risen savior and he sits on the throne. We're going to be okay because Jesus holds all things in his hands. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you for this profound opportunity we have to, to celebrate our risen Savior. God, thank you for the beauty of the gospel message of what Christ has completed for us. And how we get to turn from the people we used to be and experience life in Jesus. God, thank you for what you have accomplished. Thank you for not being afraid of our doubts. Thank you for not holding our past against us and saying, you went too far, I don't want you anymore. Thank you, oh God, for welcoming us into the family through Jesus. And on this resurrection weekend, we thank you for the opportunity to celebrate our salvation and to point others to Jesus where we found hope. God, thank you for what you're doing in us. Thank you for what you're going to continue to do in us and in others. Use us, O oh God, to your glory. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. What a beautiful opportunity for us to worship together without being together. We're going to be okay. Like way better than okay. Jesus is on the throne holding all things together. And if you're new with us, we are so glad you're here. We're so glad you're taking this journey with us. And, and I have a favor to ask of you. I, I, I want to ask you to send us a text. You're going to text us to the number 94,000, the message new online to let us know you're here. 
We want to take this journey with you. We have resources, we have encouragement, we have communication that we want to have with you as we take this beautiful journey we call faith together. And if today was your first day, was today the day that you declared faith in Jesus, I want you to do the very same thing. Text new online to the number 94,000. And we're going to give you an opportunity to indicate that today was the day that you placed faith in Jesus so we can resource you, encourage you, and take this journey with you. Don't do it alone. We can be together without having to be together and take this journey we call faith together. And so, yes, it's been a little different. It's been a little challenging. But we still have the opportunity to worship together We still have the opportunity to share the gospel together. One of the ladies in in our church, Katrina, said, you know what? It's kind of like when the Apostle Paul was in prison. He still got the word out. He still shared the gospel. He was in chains, but the gospel was not chained. Check on your neighbors. Call, encourage Share on social media. We, we see messages that we've sent out, messages of hope that are going far wider than they ever have before as you share and in, as you encourage. We might be sheltering in place, but the gospel can still be shared. Take those opportunities to share the good news of Jesus during this season.